So I want to move a little bit into more interplanetary mission design. And one thing that I'm really curious about is the fact that when the mission designers go about designing, say, a mission to Jupiter or a mission to Neptune or Pluto, is that they do a bunch of flybys of the inner planets and other planets. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. kind of wondering how that process goes of going through design because I feel like there's so much freedom and the problem isn't very restricted because I feel like you can do Earth, Moon, Venus, Mars, flybys, and you can just do a bunch of that. So I'm wondering, yeah, just how that process goes of actually picking these flybys. Sorry, could not hear the last part. You are wondering if you can pick what? Oh, just, just the process of how to pick these flybys just because there's so much freedom to pick just whatever, you know, order of flybys like Earth, Moon, Earth, Earth, Venus, uh, Mars, all that. Yeah, so the, the, there's two answers. The first answer is there's no way to pick them. You just have to try them all, uh, which is a bad answer. The, the good answer is that we have some, some idea. So uh, the, the first one, you have probably heard that uh, Tisserand, an old astronomer of the, oh God, I, I forgot, I think it was the 17th century. Anyway, this person of last name, Tisserand, uh, invented a criteria for uh, when a comet flies by Jupiter, it sometimes explodes. And then you had one comet and then it passes by Jupiter, it explodes. And there are several pieces of the comet. So at some point, they didn't know which one, which piece was from what comet. Uh, and this guy, Tisserand, uh, this developed a criteria that said, okay, everything changes after the flyby and the subsequent explosion. But this one parameter doesn't, or doesn't, approximately doesn't. And he invented this criterion uh, that allowed you to distinguish one thing before and after a flyby. So we use something similar. Uh, you can tell a priori what kind of change in your orbit you can expect from a flyby with each one of the planets or with any massive body. Uh, you know what is the mass of the body uh, depending on the incoming uh, hyperbolic velocity that you have with respect to the body and the altitude that you fly by it. You know how much it would rotate your velocity vector relative to the sun or relative to the center of, of the trajectory that you are investigating. And, uh, and you can uh, bring these arguments into some sort of energy argument and finally develop something that is called the Tisserand parameter, uh, which is inspired by this guy Tisserand. So you create these plots uh, that tell you, okay, if I was at Earth with a VMT of so-and-so, say, uh, nine kilometers per second, and I made a flyby, I could energetically reach, for example, Venus. And if I did, I could reach it approximately with this so-and-so uh, hyperbolic velocity. And if I did, then I could reach, say, Jupiter, or I could reach Earth back again, or I could then orbit once and then reach Venus back again. And uh, so we do have some guideline on how to look. So you know that you are not in one flyby going to reach Uranus. You know that. Uh, because there's energetically not possible. Your time of flight is not sufficient. There's not enough energy in your orbit to have an apoapse that will intersect the orbit of the planet that you're trying to reach. So when you have that TSRN criterion, your energy arguments, your charts that allow you to see uh, flying by where approximately where could it take you? Uh, then you have to deal with the second problem, which is the phasing. Uh, namely, it is energetically possible to reach, say, um, Uranus with a flyby of Jupiter powered by Earth. It's energetically possible. We know that. But that doesn't mean that, that Jupiter is going to be in the good location. Mm -hmm. So then you have to find it. And unfortunately, I mean, there are some approximations. You can assume that all the planets move in a circular orbit, which is not too bad of an approximation, that they are coplanar to the ecliptic, which they are not. Uh, you and say, okay, I'm going to start with circles. I'm going to get some sort of timing. Then I'm going to, from the circle solution that is coplanar, I'm going to add some ellipticity. I'm going to add some out of playing full ephemeris. Uh, what we have done at, at Nablo Zero Labs, we, 
to search it in, in a full ephemeris. So it's not high fidelity, but it's full ephemeris very fast. Uh, and honestly, in my experience, uh, I very quickly use a discernment like criterion to discard what I cannot search. I say, okay, I'm not going to consider, for example, Mars. I'm not going to consider more than two Venus flybys, and I'm not going to consider Saturn. Uh, everything else is on the table. And then I just set up my time of flight bounds. I say, I want to depart from Earth with the launch vehicle. I know what Neptune within 20 years. And then I just filter what I'm not going to do. Uh, and just uh, start a very coarse search throughout the rest of the domain. I leave it running for three days with several computers and uh, just to get an initial peek at what's out there. And then once you have this very broad search after some high performance computing, then you start zooming in some regions and say, oh, look, my Earth, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Neptune are looking good for the 2040 decade. Uh, and then you start fine tuning it. You say, okay, oh, you see the flyby, it starts getting out of phase here, it starts getting in phase here, and then you start pinning it down. But at the end of the day, you just have to run a bunch of uh, studies. Again, you can study some energy, energy arguments to know what not to do, but it's artisanal and computationally a very expensive process. Okay, so once you have kind of some candidates, say you're doing a mission to Neptune and you have some candidates of trajectories that do a certain amount of flybys, so how do you go about then refining these trajectories to make them higher fidelity? So as far as you know what maneuvers you're going to do, as far as propagation, do you use a pack, uh, patch conics um, way of propagating um, Methods, yeah. How do you start refining these trajectories once you found that these are feasible and I want to look more into these? De definitely. You always start with a, a, the best friend of the mission designer, which is a Lambert solver. Uh, the orbital uh, boundary value problem is the, the name of the problem that connects two points in a space with a single point mass, so it's a two-body problem uh, solver. It connects two points in space in a pre-specified time of flight. Given the two position, it gives you the two velocities that will make that conic uh, expand the two positions in a prescribed amount of time. So you get that solution. If you have to make a flyby, then what you need to do is, okay, I go from, say, Earth to Jupiter. I solve a Lambert arc. I get the velocity at Jupiter when I came into Jupiter. And then say you want to go Jupiter, uh, Neptune. So then you solve a Lambert from Jupiter to Neptune. And that will have, so you have now an incoming V infinity at Jupiter and then outgoing V infinity from Jupiter. And you have to, because energy is conserved during a flyby, relative flyby body. So you know that the, the energy of, a, of an orbit, so energy is uh, the square of the velocity divided by two minus gravitational parameter divided by the distance. Uh, and because the velocity is conserved there, the only thing that can happen with a V-infinity vector is that it can rotate, but it cannot change its magnitude. Uh, so you need to have the magnitude of the incoming V-infinity be the same as the magnitude of the outgoing V-infinity. And then you have to evaluate the angle uh, by, by which the other, by which you have to rotate the first one to get the second one. And that angle has to be compatible with the flyby altitude. There's another formula that allows you to compute the flyby altitude re uh, given an inbound and outbound the infinity vector. I, I, for, I forget it, but it's again like a, about V infinity minus inbound V infinity, the magnitude of that equals twice V infinity divided by one plus, uh, twice V infinity divided by mu, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, you, you get the, the minimum flyby. Uh, and then you are like, okay, I got my Earth to Jupiter. It has a given V infinity vector. I got a Jupiter to Neptune. It has another V infinity vector. The magnitude of this one is the same as the magnitude of that one. And the angle between them is within the altitude that I'm willing to go. 
uh, say is greater than 200 kilometer altitude. So then you, you get this parameter. So that is called the patch conic uh, approximation. And now when you have those two, you can say, okay, now I want to solve it in full fidelity. So for the flyby, given the inbound and outbound, the infinity, you can calculate an approximate, what we call uh, full fidelity state relative to the flyby body. You normally calculate the B-plane parameters, uh, but you, you can calculate the position and the velocity of the spacecraft relative to the flyby body, and you convert that state onto the B-plane target. And then you now have an initial condition, a B-plane target, and the final condition, and you use that as the initial uh, guess, as the initial iterate for a full fidelity, multiple shooting, collocation, uh, what have you. Uh, but that is normally the process. Lambert, C3 matching or V-infinity matching, uh, approximating the states, getting the B-plane targets, and passing those on to the uh, full fidelity solver that uses uh, full ephemeris. The, calculating the launch window is a little bit different because you only have an outbound V-infinity vector. And that one, you just have to start in a circular orbit around Earth and pick a point in a, that orbit that will result in the same outbound the infinity vector. So you get the uh, right ascension, declination, and magnitude of the outbound uh, asymptote. And you just find the circle at, at which you applying a delta V, you will get that uh, outgoing uh, hyperbola. And then you, that's how you go. And then you just target coming into the next one with another plane, and off you go. Uh, it's a easier said than done, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, as far as the patch conic sense? So doing center switching and sphere of influence. So say as you're coming into Jupiter, at what point do you want to say that I'm no longer in an elliptical heliocentric orbit? I am now in a hyperbolic Jupiter orbit. And then once you come out, I'm no longer in this hyperbolic Jupiter orbit. I'm now back again into a heliocentric elliptical orbit. Yeah, normally when you, the, the answer is both simple as complex. When you want to consider Jupiter as a flyby, in the case of Jupiter in particular, you would uh, always do it when you are within its actual sphere of influence, when, when you, which you can calculate. In my case, to me, Jupiter is a two million kilometer kind of deal. Uh, if, if you are three million kilometers from Jupiter, I normally do not enter its sphere of influence. I, I normally don't consider it as an individual point mass subject to the little moons orbiting. I just consider it a, like a barycenter with all the mass at its center at three million kilometers, uh, just as a rule of thumb. But if I'm considering as a flyby, is normally because I'm closer to it, like say two million kilometers and closer, uh, then it is just, I put the, the pointer and when I get to that uh, three, two and a half million kilometer distance, then I trigger the center switching. Uh, and, and precisely what you said happens. You are a heliocentric, elliptical, uh, not necessarily elliptical, you can have a, a non-elliptical like New Horizons, for example, it had a non-elliptical uh, orbit, uh, relative to the sun, it was like a screeching when the spacecraft took off. You, Helios, the big plane, which are approximately linear uh, relative to the velocity at the beginning. That's why we use them, because they are not as wildly varying as the norm. If you just compute the distance to Jupiter, that's obviously a quadratic, uh, because you have a vector, another vector, you subtract them and you, you take the norm, which is a square root. So it's a square and then a square root of the square. So that has, unfortunately, it's very numerically complex, whereas the B-plane, it's almost linear. That's why it was designed like that, because it uses hyperbolas. Um, so, so you only, when you consider the body as a flyby, you do the center switching. When you consider it as a disturbance, you do the center switching. And if you define your, your spheres of influence appropriately, namely, uh, I should really learn that formula. I don't know why I never learned it. There's a formula that to calculate, to calculate the sphere of influence of a, of, of a body relative to another. And you just who is this to derive it, is what is the radius that, given the mass of this body, what is the radius at which the force that I'm feeling 
is the same as that other body uh, in another sphere. So if the, uh, one body is very big, then the sphere is big. And then if it has another tiny body, then this one has a sphere. And if you get very close to it, at some point, the force is going to be the same. So that radius is the sphere of influence. Uh, so you just compute the actual sphere of influence for each one of the planets. Uh, normally, it goes well. Unless you're in the Earth-Moon, in the Earth-Moon, you often always want to use both independently. 